Have you ever been lonely, really lonely? Have you ever felt that you were just absolutely alone and all by yourself for even a period of time? And did someone come in, enter your life to help you? Did the Lord do something to help you through that? I'm Jim Taylor. Welcome to In Favor Resources and to this video teaching series on how to increase our faith. We're looking to enlarge our capacity to, to confidently trust in God and in his power in every area of our life. And the last three or four videos in this series have been kind of a series within a series. They've all had the theme of holding on to our faith in these contrary circumstances that are pushing against our trust in God. So how can we hold on to our faith in death, in times of waiting, in the night watches? And this video here, number 15 in the series, is holding on to our faith in our loneliness. When we are all alone, when we're without friendship or support, when we feel like we can't or, or don't want to go on. So I'm going to ask you again to download the handout for this, uh, this video. It's a InFavorResources.com. Go to the uh, Increasing Our Faith series. Look for number 15 and download that, print it out, and follow along by filling in the blanks as we go today. So our story begins in Bethlehem when there was a famine in the land of Judah. And a man named Elimelech took his family, which would be his wife, Naomi, and two sons. The four of them went to Moab to live. They had to travel down uh, by the Jordan River, around the Dead Sea, and then up into that mountainous area of Moab where there was food. They didn't have food where they'd come from, so they traveled to where the food was. Now, I'm sure that moving away from home was difficult, but it would have helped to have the family there together. Mom, Dad, the two boys, until they weren't together anymore because tra tragedy struck their family. First of all, Naomi's husband died. But then she still had her two sons, and they would have taken care of their mom, I'm sure. They both married Moabite women. One was named Orpah, and the other one was named Ruth. And during the next 10 years, there was additional tragedy, because both of Naomi's sons passed away as well. So now Naomi was far away from home, far away from everyone she knew, and she had lost her husband, and she had lost both of her sons. So when she heard that the famine was over in Judah... And she wanted to go back, and she's ready to go home. And she released both of her daughters-in-law and encouraged them to marry again. And so they said goodbye to each other, tearful goodbyes, kissed each other. And then we take up the story in Ruth chapter 1, verse 9. She kissed them goodbye, and they wept out loud, and said to her, We'll go back with you to your people. But Naomi said, No, return home, my daughters. Why would you come with me? I'm not going to have any more sons. Who could become your husband? So he said, No. Even if I thought there was still hope for me, even if I had a husband tonight and give birth to sons, you're not going to wait until they grow up. Would you remain unmarried until then? No. It is, this is, listen to what she says here. This is verse 13. It is more bitter for me than for you because the Lord's hand has turned against me, she said. In other words, Naomi blamed God for her loneliness. The entire situation she laid at God's feet and said, God, you did this. This is how she interpreted all of these events in her life. I've got no one. I lost my family and my God has deserted to me. So on your handout there, the first set of blanks say, it is easy to blame God for our loneliness. It is easy to blame God for our loneliness and to believe that our situation is worse than anyone else's. When you're lonely and you're upset about it, you don't say, well, at least I'm better off than so-and-so. Right? I'm not as bad as those guys. No, you don't think that at all. You think that nobody has ever been through this. I've got it worse than everybody else, and God's not doing anything for me. But perhaps he is about to, if we can be patient enough and be open enough to see it. So in our story, uh, they wept aloud again. Orpah kissed her mother-in-law goodbye and left the one daughter-in-law left to go back home, but Ruth, the second daughter-in-law, clung to her, the text says. Look, said Naomi, your sister-in-law is going back to her people and her gods. Go back with her. But Ruth replied, don't urge me to leave you or to turn back from you. Uh, she said, um, 
And these, these famous words came out of her mouth. Where you go, I will go. Where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people and your God will be my God. And where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. So may the Lord himself deal with me ever so severely, if even death separates between you and me. She was saying, I'm, I will live with you, and I will die with you. I will never leave you. So, on your handout, it turns out that Naomi really wasn't alone. She really wasn't alone. She was not all by herself, and that becomes very important later. So continuing in verse 18, when Naomi realized that Ruth was determined to go with her, she stopped urging her. So the two women went on until they came to Bethlehem. When they arrived in Bethlehem, the whole town was stirred because of them. And the women exclaimed, can this be Naomi? Everybody was excited. Everyone was interested, and they couldn't believe it was her. Now, maybe because... They had left, and they didn't expect to see her back. Maybe because she had left with three men, and none of the men came back. Well, what I think is most likely is that just these years and the sorrows and the loneliness had wore her down. I think her face was lined with wrinkles. I think her shoulders were slumped. I think she looked like a shell of the person she had been when she left that country. I think just being worn down by sorrow, which was legitimate, and self-pity, which was less legitimate. And her answer to that was, oh, don't call me Naomi, she told them. Call me Mara. That's the Hebrew word for bitter. Call me bitter, because the Almighty has made my life very bitter. And then she says, I went away full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. Oh, I call me Naomi. The Lord, once again now, she blames God. The Lord has afflicted me. The Almighty has brought misfortune upon me. This is God's doing. This is God's fault. So Naomi returned from Moab, accompanied by Ruth the Moabite, her daughter-in-law. And then a few other things happen. But we pick up again in chapter 3, verse 1, where it says, One day, Ruth's mother-in-law, Naomi, said to her, My daughter, I must find a home for you where you will be well provided for. And that's the moment that everything changes in this story in the book of Ruth. That's the moment everything changes. Not only did Naomi need Ruth, these are the blanks on your handout, not only did Naomi need Ruth, but this was not a one-way thing. Um, this was not a charity case. Ruth needed Naomi too. Naomi realizes the reason she is still alive. She has a purpose for being here on earth, and it's a big purpose. She won't even understand, possibly, but later generations will. And you know how this story turned out. A very handsome, wealthy, kind, and generous man named Boaz takes an interest in them. And Naomi skillfully guides Ruth in how to catch the man you want. I mean, remember that Ruth was a Moabitess. She... I, in Moab, maybe they just rode by on a horse and grabbed him and picked you up and said, you're mine now. But that's not the way they did it in Israel. And Ruth, because, I mean, yes, uh, Naomi, because she had already married off two sons and been married herself. She knew the courting rituals. She knew how it was done. She knew the culture. She knew how you went about finding a man and marrying them. So a touching love story develops and culminates in a marriage and a child. And then at that point, now we're in verse 13, the women said to Naomi, well, praise be to the Lord, who this day has not left you without a guardian redeemer. May he be famous throughout Israel. He will renew your life and sustain you in your old age. For your daughter-in-law, now they're thinking of her sons that had died, your daughter-in-law who loves you and is better than seven sons has given you birth. And Naomi took the child in her arms and cared for him. This is a touching picture. This apparently is Naomi's first grandchild. And as she holds that child, things change. Others saw it too. The women living there said, Naomi has a son. Now she's got a purpose. And that son would have a son, and that son would have a son, and so on and so on, until Jesus was the next son. So Matthew 1, giving the genealogy, says Salmon was the father of Boaz, this is the man in our story, whose mother was Rahab, and Boaz was the father of Obed, that would have been the boy that Naomi was holding, 
whose mother was Ruth. And Obed was the father of Jesse, and Jesse was the father of King David. And it's through the line of David that the Messiah comes. Her life was certainly very bitter, but it turned out to be eternally sweet. So some suggestions for pressing into this. For when you feel lonely, when you feel alone, when it seems like the, that God himself is afflicting you and has left you, Read again, in addition to the, the book of Ruth, read again that well-known story about Elijah in 1 Kings 19. Now, Elijah is in a cave. He's all alone, and he too is mad at God. 1 Kings 19.9, 9. Then he went into a cave and spent the night. And the word of the Lord came to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? I don't think he was just asking about why are you in a cave. I think he was saying, Why are you wallowing in this self-pity? And Elijah replied, Oh, I've been very zealous for you, God. The Israelites have rejected you and torn down your altars, but I am the only one left, and now they're trying to kill me too. And he is told that the Lord is going to pass by. And so he goes out, and, and you know the story. There's a powerful wind, but God's not in the wind. An earthquake, God's not in that. The fire, but God's not in the fire. But then there came a gentle whisper, and Elijah knew that God was speaking. And so he went out, pulled his cloak over his face, and stood at the mouth of the cave. And again, the voice said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? What are you doing here? And he replied again, Oh, I've been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty, and the Israelites have done all these horrible things, and they're killing people, and I'm the only one left, and now they're trying to kill me too. And then God does something strange. He does kind of the same thing that he did with Naomi. He gave him things to do. He gave him his assignments. He said, Go back and... Uh, when you get there, anoint Hazel, king over Aram, and anoint Jehu, son of Nimshi, over Israel, and then anoint Elisha to succeed you as prophet. Elijah, all these people need you. I need you to go to them and do what only you can do as my chosen prophet. You've got jobs to do. You've got responsibilities for the kingdom of God. And more importantly, God says in verse 18, Yet I reserve 7,000 in Israel, all of whom whose knees have not bowed to Baal and whose mouths have not kissed him. Elijah, you think you're alone? There are 7,000 other people, just like you, that are still alive. You're not alone. It turns out that Elijah wasn't really alone either. There were not only people like him still around, people that he needed, but there were other people who needed him to minister to them. He realized that he needed other people, and other people realized that they needed him. Now, you and I might be an Elijah today. You and I might be at Naomi today. Remember the words of the chorus, Though none go with me, even if I think I'm all alone, still I will follow. No turning back, no turning back. Hold on to your faith, even when you're lonely. Even it seems like you're the only one out there. Even if it seems like God is being especially mean to you. Hold on to your faith, even when it seems no one else is there to help you. Someone said, when we feel alone, what often helps us to not slip into bitterness is to see the purpose we have in other people's lives. It doesn't take away the pain or difficulty of what we're going through, but it can help us both see the light and be the light in the midst of darkness. So what is your assignment? And if you know that, then hold on to your faith, even when you are lonely. Next video, holding on to our faith in pain and suffering.